All right, welcome everybody. Um, so I think we can get started. Is the sound working? Can you hear me? Yes, great, thanks. I can't check it myself for some reason. So today we'll talk about uh, clustering and mixture models. So this is another uh, class of algorithms in unsupervised learning. So clustering is basically one of the fundamental tasks in machine learning. And uh, while I find it is not nearly as commonly used as like, say supervised learning, um, I think it's still an important part to discuss. So we'll start with clustering and most of the lecture today will be clustering and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, mixture models. So the main idea of clustering is you're given a bunch of data points, um, so it's an unsupervised algorithm, so you only get a data matrix X. And the goal is to uh, find um, disjoint groups in the data. So you want to assign each data point to one out of, say, K groups. If your data looks like it is in the slide here, oh, you can't see it on the slide. Give me one second, I need to fix this. Um, I don't know what happened here. Can you see my slide now with the points? Yes, sweet. Um, okay, so if you have data uh, like here, in, uh, where there's uh, very clear groups in data that, that often can easily be successful. And so what you would want is you want to assign um, each point to uh, one cluster. So uh, there's some relationship with classification, but here you're not given any ground truth. You're just given the data and you're supposed to find some grouping of the data into disjoint clusters. Uh, very commonly in terms of like how this is um, expressed in, uh, in programming, it is that the clusters are numbered. And so say the algorithm might uh, assign a number one to all of the points in green here, number two to the, all of the points in blue, number three to all of the points in purple. However, this is not, these numbers are not really essential to the cluster and we just number the clusters one, two, and three. And so if you um, switch the labeling between one and three, you would say it is the same clustering. So changing the names of the labels or the names of the cluster doesn't change the clustering. What you're interested in is really is, are two points in the same cluster or are they in different clusters? Okay, and so um, how are we going to go about uh, doing this clustering? So as I said, the main idea is to partition data into groups and um, there's two notions of cluster. One is like basically points within a cluster should be similar and points in different clusters should be different. And um, obviously it's similar and different are sort of very vague notions. On depending on how you define similar or different, uh, you will get different clustering algorithms. So there's probably hundreds of different clustering algorithms and um, we'll only go through three um, very well established ones today. So as all machine learning algorithms, basically clustering algorithms usually have um, some hyperparameters. A very common hyperparameter uh, is picking a number of clusters. So here in this data set, I mean, so you could say for this data set, obviously the clustering is very trivial and you could just plot the data and like make the circles. If your data set was very high dimensional, um, then maybe there is a clustering, but it's not as obvious because you can't easily plot the data. Um, in general, obviously we, we wouldn't assume our data actually has a structure that is as clean as this. Um, but given data set a priori, you would usually not know what is the number of clusters to expect. And um, so you don't know how many groups there should be, but this is very commonly a hyperparameter. If you set the hyperparameter correct, you might get um, this clustering, which looks very nice and clean. If you set the hyperparameter 
um, differently, say you're asking for four clusters, then you might get something that is maybe less natural. And so here I set the clusters to four and the cluster that was called, I guess, cluster one is now split up in, in call, into clusters two and three and all the clusters have been rena uh, renamed. And um, so the problem, or one of the main problems with clustering is that if you cluster a data set, it's unclear um, how to evaluate whether the clustering is good or not. And that's something I'll talk a little bit more about more later. But generally, it's, it's very hard to know if you apply a clustering algorithm, is the result you get useful for your application? So what are the kind of um, applications where you might want to use clustering? I think the most uh, common use case is data exploration. And so in data exploration, we are asking, uh, are there coherent groups in the data and potentially how many of these groups are there? So this is, yeah, you do exploratory data analysis, you apply a clustering algorithm and maybe you can find a representative from each of the groups and you can ask, well, are these prototypical in some way? Um, one thing that is very commonly uh, given as an example is market segmentation. Say you have a bunch of shoppers and uh, you can say, try clustering your shoppers and you can figure out are the different subgroups of shoppers that have a particular uh, different behavior. Um, another potential goal is data partitioning. So if you assume that there's different parts in the data that require different um, treatment, you could um, run a clustering algorithm and then you can do further processing on each of the clusters. So let's say um, you assume the, or you have, um, say a, a classification problem and um, you assume the model is linear, but the model is not linear overall, it's just linear for two, uh, on two subgroups, but you don't have the identity of the subgroup. But you know that they should be pretty obvious from the data. Then you could run clustering on your data set, partition the data into the two parts, um, using the clustering and then run a linear model on each of them. So generally, if you assume that there are some subgroups and the structure within the subgroup um, is, uh, is simpler, then um, uh, you could run the clustering and then apply whatever algorithm you want to the subgroup. Um, so a question I got is, can you cluster based only on certain features? And um, sure, you can like, manually subset a number of features and then just cluster these features. Uh, so this question is like in, uh, about genetics. Genetics is actually one of the uh, like main applications of clustering um, because genetics is very high dimensional and it's very hard to um, extract features from gene sequences. They use a lot of unsupervised algorithms like clustering uh, to extract, um, well, any structure of the data really. So this uh, is usually more in, in terms of uh, data exploration. Um, and um, a third uh, application is uh, unsupervised feature extraction. So this is something that um, used to be used in computer vision a lot before everything became um, convolutional neural networks. It's still used in some areas, I think. So uh, the idea is to do feature extraction um, by deriving features from cluster uh, centers or cluster distances. So um, there was actually a very interesting uh, pa paper probably 10 years ago now that showed that you could uh, get something similar to a convolutional neural network just by running k-means clustering on image patches. Um, so these days, no one would probably try to do that, but um, you can, given the data set, you can find clusters, and then you can say for each data point, how, what is the distance to each of the clusters? And this might be much more uh, semantic representation than just the raw data. And that's in particular the case for like high dimensional data, like images or something like this. So you can think of this a little bit as 
um, similar or alternative to using PCA for feature extraction. So um, when we looked at PCA, we saw we could extract these eigenfaces that um, showed like, that represented each phase as coefficients in the high dimensional space. Um, you could think of using clustering to do something similar, uh, only that it wouldn't be uh, a linear process. You would find some prototypes and you would say, well, how similar is each phase to these other prototype phases? Um, as I said, this used to be very common computer vision, uh, less so these days, but it's generally, a, it's a reasonable way to do feature extraction if you have um, some very unstructured data. All right. Um, for these different kind of um, motivations for clustering, there's different ways to evaluate new parameter tuning. Generally, parameter tuning for unsupervised algorithms is much, much trickier than it is for supervised algorithms. In supervised algorithms, as we saw, we can do parameter tuning by doing grid search and cross-validation. However, for unsupervised algorithms, there's usually no metric. There's not, no way to evaluate our results um, quantitatively. So if you do clustering, uh, you can't do cross-validation for the number of clusters, usually, because there's no accuracy to measure, because you don't have any ground truth. If you had ground truth, you could run supervised learning instead of clustering. Um, so there are some quantitative measures that you could use instead of, um, say, accuracy, but they're not very commonly used. Um, yeah, more usually you use qualitative measures. So you look at the clusters, you inspect them, and um, you try to figure out, are these clusters semantically meaningful for my task? The best thing is um, if you do feature extraction, for example, use your downstream tasks. So if you do feature extraction, then classification, then again, you can do something like cross validation because you will have a supervised task in the end. There's also um, another aspect, which is there is not really one answer. There could be different answers that are all semantically meaningful, but orthogonal. So let's think back to the faces example. If we looked at, when we looked at PCA, we saw that um, PCA distinguished from uh, faces that were like brighter on the left versus brighter on the right. Or you could think of faces that are looking to the left and faces looking to the right. Um, I think I just did it the wrong way around, but whatever. And so we'd say, well, I have these faces that are in a clustering algorithm to find two clusters, and maybe it'll find the cluster of all the faces looking to the left. Um, and the uh, uh, faces to the, uh, looking to the right. And these would be two clusters that are semantically meaningful. But you could also say, well, maybe I wanted to cluster these in uh, men and women, or maybe I wanted to cluster it into adults and children or maybe I want to cluster it into the background is brighter and the background is dark. And each of them might be um, a semantically meaningful way to, um, uh, to cluster, but sort of there's no way for you to tell the algorithm which of these is actually the clustering you're looking for. So if you're looking to like do like clusters by gender, say there's um, no way to say, tell the algorithm this is the thing I'm looking for, and say, well, now it found kids versus adults. That's not the cluster that I'm looking for, so this is wrong. Um, so there's no one correct clustering. There's just sort of, um, given one particular clustering algorithm, you can get different outcomes. Um, so there's a couple of questions about um, uh, questions. Uh, and about, sorry, evaluation metrics, quantitative and qualitative. If you're really interested in this, I think in my 2018 lecture, I gave a whole lecture on it, but I basically thought this lecture is not useful. And so um, I kind of uh, removed it from the lecture series. Um, 
basically the best thing for you is to inspect the clusters, think, look, are they um, thematically meaningful and what are you gonna use them for? There's one question about, well, uh, can you do, take distances to cluster centers um, and minimize to find an optimal K? Um, well, okay, you could say regularize by K and minimize to find an optimal quantity, but what's the regularization constant? So basically selecting the, uh, the cluster center would be equivalent to selecting the um, regularization constant. And I find tuning the regularization constant in this setting would be harder than just tuning K directly. Anyway, um, let's go, go talk about some of the um, standard clustering algorithms. So in a sense, the father of all clustering algorithms is k-means. And uh, when people say clustering, often they just mean k-means. It's just one of many, many algorithms, but it's sort of a very classical one. And it's definitely one that you should uh, understand very well. So the objective function for k-means is pretty simple. It's based on um, least squares. And it says, for each data point xi, I want to find um, a cluster center C of xi so that the distances between each, the square distances between all the points minus their closest cluster center is minimal. So I want to, given the fixed number k, I want to find k cluster centers so that the average Euclidean distance from the closest center is minimal. And um, this is sort of, in a sense, it's very, a very simple uh, objective function. However, it's uh, non-convex. And there's like, it's non-convex in obvious ways in that if you rename the cluster centers, then uh, you get a different solution. But also it's like non-convex in like non-obvious ways. So you cannot find the optimum for, of this um, uh, basically in, in polynomial time. So this is an NP hard problem to find the, the correct uh, k-means clustering, which minimizes this objective function. So all of the, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, algorithms to do k-means. And there's one standard algorithm that's also known as the uh, Lloyd's algorithm. And, um, but they are all um, approximate algorithms, where approximate is uh, used in the worst possible way, meaning um, in general, they can be arbitrary bad and take arbitrary long. Um, so Lloyd's algorithm, I think, can actually um, also take exponential time sometimes, depending on your stopping criteria. Anyway, let's talk about the algorithm. So here, um, I'm starting with some um, input data for illustration purposes. Again, this is a two-dimensional data set. And um, uh, in the easiest variant, we, we're given um, a number k of clusters. In this example, I picked num uh, the number of clusters to be three. And um, we initialize these clusters as uh, random data points from our data. These are the triangles you can see in the initialization uh, panel here. So I picked these three data points, uniform at random, and I say this is, uh, I guess, this is the center of cluster zero, the center of cluster one, the center of cluster two. Then, out from this point on, I will start iterating two steps. One is assign each data point to the closest cluster center. This is shown here. So for each point, I ask which point is the, sorry, which cluster center is the closest to this point. And so for all the uh, points up here, uh, the uh, blue cluster center is the closest. So we use Euclidean distances here. Um, for all these points here, the red um, cluster center is the closest and for the uh, points over here, the green cluster center is the closest. So this is just assigning each point to its closest cluster center. Uh, um, cluster center, basically giving it the number. Then we recompute the uh, centers as the mean of all the points that are assigned to this number. 
So now I look at all the points that are assigned cluster zero, so cluster blue, I compute the mean of them, and this is my new cluster center. For um, cluster two, I look at all the points that are assigned um, the green cluster center, and I compute the mean, and this is my new cluster center. And then I iterate these two steps. So now we, we move the means around, so from here to here, um, the blue just moved to the center, the green one moved a little bit to the right and to the top. And now I reassign the points again and iterate. So I reassign the points um, to the closest cluster center, then I recompute the centers uh, as the mean of the points in the cluster. You can see the blue one already doesn't change and the green one keeps moving a little bit to the right. And I uh, reassign the points again. And if I recompute, and I recompute the centers. If I now reassign the points again, the assignment will not change. And um, so that means the algorithm converged because if I do any more iterations, nothing will happen. There's also ways to stop um, the algorithm uh, earlier, but sort of the standard stopping criterion would be if the points don't change anymore, if the assignment of cluster doesn't change anymore, the algorithm has converged. And then I said, this is an approximate solution to the k-means objective function, um, but it is sort of the most commonly used al or, uh, algorithm in a sense. And for a simple data set, um, like this here, you can, it easily discovers the three different cluster centers. I also picked the number of clusters correctly. Um, there's a question, Saying, so we stop calculating values for the centers one by one as they stop changing. Um, no, you can't really do this. So I'll talk, there's like some tricks you can do, but it's not as simple as that because like um, another cluster center could move closer, right? So you could say, so yeah, it's, it's not as simple as that. Um, just when nothing changes anymore, you stop. The other stopping criterion that's a little bit uh, not as strict is if your cluster centers don't move more than a distance of some epsilon, then you stop. And this here is the, the extreme case of is the cluster centers move by zero, you stop. But you can also let them move just a little bit. Okay. All right. So um, here's the K-means API for second learn. So I just make some blobs and here actually I made uh, four centers, though they're maybe not that visible from, from the plot. And um, the uh, number of clusters is set to five. If I call fit, it will run the algorithm until it converges and I will get the cluster centers in the cluster centers attribute in the labels in the labels attribute. And labels are basically the assignment of each of the 100 points to one of the five uh, cluster centers. And um, so k-means is a clustering algorithm where you can easily compute for a new data point which cluster it belongs to. So if someone gives you a new cluster point, you can just ask, uh, which is the closest cluster center, and um, oh, then you assign this cluster center. So k-means actually has a predict function. The predict function gives you the labels from zero to number of clusters minus one. Uh, the make blobs function here generates some synthetic data. <coughs> and so here I'm just scattering the data together with the labels. I could also um, call k-means.predict, k and this will give me the same as k-means.labels on the training data set. Um, but I can also apply k-means to new data with the predict method. Um, so a couple of properties for, of k-means that are interesting. Um, actually, give me one second. Uh, okay. So the first is the cluster shapes are limited to be um, the Voronoi diagram of centers. So basically, 
if you don't know what a Voronoi diagram is, it doesn't matter so much, but basically it means that the boundaries of each cluster are convex. And so you can only have relatively simple shapes. Um, and so you can see two examples of clusters here. You can see these lines uh, show you where um, the boundary between uh, the clusters is. So if you would look at the new point here, it would be classified as green. If you look at a new point here, it would be class or clustered as green, and here it would be clustered as the cyan cluster. And um, I meant magenta, not cyan. Magenta cluster. Um, and so you can see that the points in this cluster are the points that are closer to the blue triangle than they are closer than they are to any of the other uh, cluster centers around it. And so you can't have something like a banana shape or you can't have like a circle with a hole in it or something like this. So if you have points within a cluster, all the points within the convex hull of these points will also be in the same cluster. So this is one of the uh, limitations of k-means. Another is that uh, the cluster boundaries are equidistant to the centers. So here, if I have this synthetic data set, um, there are actually three, um, this is a mixture, of, well, this is three Gaussian blobs, one in the center, one over here, and one over here. However, actually, the, um, what, I, what I would call the, the correct clustering, there is no correct clustering, but what I would find would be natural would be to have a broad thing in the center and like a more concentrated blob here and a more concentrated blob here. Um, but uh, there is uh, no concept of um, width of a cluster. So in a sense, all the clusters have the same, same width as, or the boundary between two clusters is exactly in the middle of the two clusters. So if the center of the green cluster is here, and the center of the blue cluster is here, then the boundary will be exactly in the middle, even though it doesn't really reflect the shape of the data. Um, Another limitation is that it can't take a uh, covariance structure into account. So here again, I have like these three Gaussian blobs. I run k-means on it, and this is the result. So again, this is not maybe the result I would find most natural, but um, k-means does know that there is like a co uh, this elongated covariance structure in here. Um, so these are all like limitations of k-means as illustrated on toy data sets. It's not entirely clear if these really matter on real world data, but I think they help to understand how the algorithm works and what are the cases where it works and what are the failure cases. Yeah, and finally, as I said, you can only have very simple cluster shapes. So on my favorite data set here, these two, uh, 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 two moons data set or bananas data set, um, this is, impossible to learn for k-means because if you have two points within a cluster then um, all the or if you have points in a cluster all the points in the convex hull will be in the same cluster and so you basically you cannot possibly separate the two uh, moons using k-means all right so um, talking a couple of computational properties. So the algorithm that I showed is known as Lloyd's implementation, uh, Lloyd's algorithm. I'm not entirely sure, it's like, it's pretty old. I think it might be from the seventies. Um, and so in each iteration, you compute the distance from each cluster to each sample. And so this is actually um, somewhat expensive there is um, several other algorithms. Uh, one class of algorithms are what's called fast exact algorithms. Uh, I think the most uh, well-known of these is Alcan's. There's also one called Ying Yang. So Alcan's is maybe from the 90s. Ying Yang is uh, much more recent, maybe from eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, and people uh, improve them. 
So these are called exact algorithms because they give you exactly the same uh, the, exactly the same um, result as Lloyd's algorithm, but they are faster. They do not solve the objective function for k-means exactly because that's impossible or that's like NP hard. Um, they give you exactly the same algorithm as um, sorry, exactly the same result as Lloyd's algorithm. And sort of, because people have been using Lloyd's algorithm, this is called exact. There's also approximate algorithms, for example, uh, mini batch k-means, which is also in scikit-learn. Uh, they, they don't give you the same result as Lloyd's algorithm, but they might still give you a good result. So it's, it's a little bit unclear whether um, giving you exactly the same result as Lloyd's algorithm is like a beneficial feature because it's like people treat it as being the correct answer because it has been the answer since the 70s, but it's not really the exact answer, right? Um, but it allows you to uh, basically exchange any of these implementations, Alcan, Zing, Yang, whatever, um, and it will give you the same result, only potentially faster. Um, can you please mute someone just uh, unmute themselves, I think. All right. Um, another important aspect of k-means is the initialization. And so I said we initialize it randomly. It's actually not um, really a very smart way to do this, but it's a very fast way to do this. So random representation is super fast, in particular if you look for a lot of clusters, like hundreds or thousands, maybe random initialization is fine. There's not the initialization that is the default in scikit-meet, uh, in scikit-learn, um, which is called k-means plus plus. k-means plus plus um, basically picks a point at random and then greedily adds the furthest away point from this cluster center. And this often makes things converge much, much more quickly, particularly for like core data sets. Um, so I don't have a fi figure for this, but basically the idea is, so you have your blobs, you um, pick a point, then you pick basically the point that's the furthest away in your data. And then once you have this, these two, uh, you again, pick the point that's furthest away from these two, that would be like over there. So you try to spread it out as much as possible throughout the data. However, you have to compute the distance of this, of the points you picked so far to all the data points. Uh, and so this can be very computationally intensive. And so in some cases, um, doing this, this initialization may take longer than the clustering. So if you look for many cluster centers or if you're very high dimensional, um, maybe try to do random uh, initialization because it's much faster. Um, by default, k-means does uh, 10 random restarts with different initializations. So also keep that in mind. If you just want a quick result, then um, you can set the number of uh, iteration initializations to uh, to one in scikit learn and it doesn't do multiple random restarts. So between the multiple random restarts, it uses the actual objective function. So this guy, this is the like thing that we are actually trying to optimize, and the one that um, minimizes the sum of square distances is the cluster center that we actually pick out of these 10 random restarts. All right, so um, I already uh, briefly mentioned feature extraction using k-means, and so I don't want to go over this like, uh, uh, too much again, but um, oh yeah, th there's actually a reference to the paper from 2011, where someone uh, replaced some convolutional neural net on CIFAR um, by uh, doing k-means clustering. And I thought it was, uh, well, at least then it was like quite interesting. I think it's still interesting as an example of how to do um, uh, feature extraction using k-means. All right. Um, So let's move on to a Gaumer shift clustering. 
Agglomerative clustering is also one of the very sort of uh, traditional and foundational ways of doing clustering. Agglomerative clustering, sometimes uh, also known as hierarchical clustering, so they're not entirely the same thing. Um, it's actually, it's a family of algorithms. It's a family of algorithms that usually uh, work in a greedy way uh, by merging existing clusters iteratively. And so this is also something, um, yeah, people have been using or working on for like, uh, I don't know, decades. So the idea is that um, you initialize, say with each point being an individual cluster, and then you iteratively merge the two uh, clusters that are the most similar. So you need to have some way to um, define similarity of clusters. If you have any way to de define the similarity of two clusters, so two groups of points, then uh, you can run agglomerative clustering using the similarity measure. And so um, if you initialize here um, with each point being its individual cluster, in the first step you would say, well, these point, two points are very close to each other. They um, are grouped into one cluster together. Then maybe the next closest are these two and they're grouped into one cluster together and so on and so on. And then at some point here, um, this, given this particular similar the similarity measure, this point is actually, um, or th this point is very similar to these points, so they get moved into a bigger cluster, and so on and so on. And um, I think actually like two steps from here, so here you have three clusters. If I do another step, these two will be merged. And if I do another step, each all of the clusters will be merged into one single cluster. Um, so, agglomerative clustering doesn't, uh, is, uh, it's also usually like a greedy approximation. Um, depending on what distance measure you use, it might actually be, you can write down the objective function or sometimes it might just be a heuristic. Um, the reason why this is also known as hierarchical clustering is, is that you don't actually get out one clustering of the data you can think of each step here as a different clustering of the data. So the first step, which point is in a separate cluster, is obviously not very informative. And like if I go to step 11, where everything is a single cluster, it's also not very informative. But each step in between corresponds to some non-trivial clustering of the data. Um, this is often expressed as um, what is known as a dendrogram. So the dendrogram, um, shows uh, when two points get merged. So here on the y-axis, we have um, just the samples. They're reordered to make the graph easier to read. On the x-axis, we have the samples. On the y-axis, we have the dissimilarity of cluster or distance between clusters. And so um, you read this graph from the bottom to the top and you can see the point number one, point number four will merge the first first and they only they were quite similar and um, then point in, uh, six and nine were merged they were not entirely as similar you can see that um, the difference in similarity between the cluster of zero and eleven and five was very small and so basically the the further a stretch is on the y-axis the more dissimilar the clusters are and if you um, cut at any possible horizontal line, it will give you a different clustering. And so if you cut at this line here where the cluster distance is four, you will get three clusters. So this would be this blob, and then this blob, and this blob. It's the clustering that we showed on the last slide. If you cut over here, um, then you get two clusters, which are shown here. It's like this one at the bottom, this one at the top. Um, so you could use this uh, dendrogram to define different ways of um, selecting a single clustering. So okay, this is 
basically it's a hierarchy of clusterings where each um, if you go down, each clustering is a refinement of the uh, other of the coarser clusterings, and if you go up, basically you're just merging clusters together to get a more coarser clustering. And so you can, in a sense, you can zoom in and out of different cluster centers. Um, there are some heuristics to say, like, where, where do I want to cut this? You could do this by specifying the number of clusters and say, well, I want three clusters, and then it would cut here. Or you could figure out, um, well, I want the one where we have basically the longest vertical stretch. Um, and you'd also get three clusters. Or you could just say, oh, well, I just want two clusters. I want five clusters, and so on. Or you could look at the dendrogram and given what it looks like, you could decide maybe three clusters is, um, looks most reasonable for this data looking at the structure of the dendrogram. So, so the algorithm is quite simple. Um, one thing that, is, uh, that I haven't explained so far is how to measure the distances um, between clusters. And in scikit-learn, there are four criteria, which are probably the most commonly used uh, ones. Um, so agglomerative clustering is implemented both in scikit-learn and also directly in SciPy, um, and they have like slightly different features. Um, so here I have a data set that is not as easily uh, separable than the blobs that I showed earlier. And you can see very clearly the difference between the different linking criteria. So single linkage it, um, is a different, is a criteria where you look at the smallest minimum distance between clusters. So if you look at two clusters, you want to compare their distance or their dissimilarity. You look at the points that are closest to each other between the clusters and uh, look at this uh, distance. Um, average linkage looks at the average distance between all pairs in the clusters. Um, this is actually not too hard to compute. Um, so that looks at um, for each point in one cluster, compute the distance to the other points in the other cluster, and the other and for each point in this cluster, compute all distance to each point in this cluster, and uh, then average it. Well, I, I mean, actually, I only have to do one of these calculations because they're the same. But um, uh, so you look at the average distances. Complete linkage looks at the smallest maximum distance. So if you compare two clusters, you look at the furthest away points between the two clusters. So if I have a cluster here and I have a cluster here, look at the point that's furthest away from the other cluster and uh, look at this distance. And then uh, work, which is the default in cycle learn, it's a little bit more elaborate. It says the smallest in, you merge the clusters that have, where merging the clusters gives the smallest increase in within cluster variance. So this is not, um, so this looks at variance, not just at uh, point-wise distances. Um, so this actually um, encourages more similarly sized clusters. So here what I have on the left-hand side is um, looking at, um, at this, in this Gaussian blob, um, the cluster sizes for cluster one, two, three, four, five. If you look at single linkage, single linkage, uh, linkage um, tends to just cut off outliers as their own clusters. You can see here, one basically all the points are in the blue cluster. If I ask for five clusters, all points are in the blue cluster. And then there's this orange, green, purple, and red point, which are the furthest away points, and they each get their own cluster. This is not really that interesting in clustering. Um, so it's very susceptible to outliers. If I look at average um, linkage, this is uh, sort of similar, though not as bad. If I look at complete linkage, um, again, it's like a little bit, uh, you get a little bit more equally sized clusters, but you still get a cluster of 0.1. And if you look at work, then the clusters are much more uh, similarly sized. And so a question is like, 
how much do you want the clusters to be compact versus how much do you want the clusters to be similar sized? Um, and so single linkage gives you very compact clusters, warp gives you very similar sized clusters. Where, I mean, you could argue whether this, this blue is compact or not. Um, another way to um, think about single linkage is single linkage basically computes a minimum spanning tree of the data, the Euclidean minimum spanning tree of the data, and then cuts the longest edges in the graph. If you know what a minimum spanning tree, a Euclidean minimum spanning tree is, I think that's a very like natural way to um, think about it. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Um, all right, so here's a couple of pros and cons. Um, so we can restrict the input uh, topology to a graph. So what I mean by this is that um, if we already know something of the structure of the space, we can use this to um, construct a graph and only look at the distances um, within points that are connected in this graph. This, is, this has been used in particular in um, image segmentation. So in image segmentation, you often try to cluster pixels. Um, if you look at the pixels in an image, in, images have like a 2D grid structure. And so you only consider two points to be able to be in the same cluster if they're connected on this 2D grid. Um, the other people working on scikit-learn do a lot of work in um, neuroimaging. And in neuroimaging, you have the 3D voxel structure of your uh, MRI images of the brain. And so this 3D voxel structure restricts the topology of the, um, of the connectivity. So you don't want a point over here and a point over here to be in the same cluster unless the points in between are also in the same cluster. And this makes us uh, doing very, very fast computations. Um, so if you have what I call sparse connectivity, which is if you have this, um, if you have like a 2D or 3D image structure, this means each pi uh, pixel or voxel is only connected to like nine or something like this neighbors, then um, this is very fast to compute. If you compute the distances between all points, this is something like O of uh, uh, N squared log N. So it's like squared in data, which is not, not super fast. Um, yeah, some linkage criteria um, create very imbalanced cluster sizes. So that's a little bit tricky. With warp, you don't get that as much. And um, looking at hierarchical clustering, this, these dendrograms are kind of nice because they give you a more holistic view than a single cluster. Um, one thing that I mentioned is that with this agglomerative clustering, this is a greedy approach starting from the whole data set. And um, this means you cannot apply this to new data easily. So if you run a kilometer clustering and someone gives you a new data point, there's no really natural way to say which cluster does it belong to because it might change the structure of the whole, uh, the whole um, clustering. You could say, well, I'm going to add this point to the cluster that is, it's the most similar to, and that would be sort of an okay heuristic, but if you then, but it's very different from running the clustering, including this point. Um, also, um, something you should um, keep in mind for clustering algorithms that are not k-means, k-means is nice in that it gives you these cluster centers, and the cluster centers completely represent the clustering. It's a very compact representation of a clustering in k-means. In agglomerative clustering, there are no cluster centers. So there's no compact way to represent the clustering instead of just listing all the points in each of the clusters. That's the only way to really represent the clustering. And you can compute the mean of each of the clusters, but it doesn't represent the clustering in the way that it does in k-means. All right. 
Finally, um, the last clustering algorithm I want to talk about is VBSCAN, which is a slightly uh, more recent algorithm that's in scikit-learn. Um, at the end, it will also, or there's an extension of it called um, HDB scan, which might be um, actually even better. It's not in scikit-learn yet, but you can find HDB scan um, on, on GitHub. It's uh, actually from the same guy that did uh, UMAP, uh, Leland McInnes. So as I said, he's like a whiz with uh, graph algorithms. Um, so also check out uh, HDB scan, even though it's not in the lecture. So this is also sort of a graph and distance based um, um, iterative algorithm. It so it has a little bit of a similar flavor to agglomerative clustering, but it does not produce a hierarchical clustering. It just produces a clustering. And again, this is also just a clustering for the points you're given, and there's not an obvious way to assign clusters to new points. And there's also not a, no compact representation of the clustering as, it, as there is in k-means. So there's a couple of important concepts for trying to understand PP scan. So there's two parameters, uh, parameter apps, which is uh, the, called the neighborhood radius, and a number of minimum samples per clusters. And so here in this example, it's just like a very simple pi example. Um, I, I said as a parameter, a minimum uh, number of samples in a cluster is four. So given these apps, you can build a neighborhood graph. So apps is represented by circles in this graph. And um, so if given looking at one point, if another point is within uh, epsilon distance or eps distance, then um, we say they're neighbors basically. If not, then they're not. So the way the algorithm works, it is, it starts um, oh, randomly at any point. So let's say we start at point A and it then iterates over all the points in, um, so it, sorry, it assigns, it, it creates a new cluster center for this point. So now we call this cluster say red. And um, if with the, it, so, sorry, if within the epsilon radius, there's at least minimum number of samples, so in this case, four points, um, or sorry, minimum number of samples minus one points. So if within this radius, we have four points, so A plus three other points, then we start a new cluster. We call this cluster red here. And um, also we call the sample a core sample. A core sample is one that um, has min samples minus one many neighbors in its radius. Then um, we add all its neighbors to like a priority queue or to, to a queue. And um, we label them also with red. Then uh, once we did that, we pick a point from our queue, which is like, this, this guy over here. Um, it was already labeled red. And um, then we um, iterate over all the neighbors that are not assigned to any cluster yet. So that it will be this point and this point. And we also assign them uh, as, as red if they have um, enough, sent, enough uh, samples. We, also, uh, we call them core samples and we uh, add the neighbors to the priority queue. If a sample is not a core sample, which is B and C here, so they don't have three neighbors within their radius, then this means the, uh, their neighbors don't get added to the priority queue. So if there was a point over here, we would not propagate the red cluster label to the point over here because B is not a core sample. So basically you start at one point when you spread out the cluster and until you hit a point that is not a core sample anymore and then you stop spreading. And so um, these two parameters are pretty crucial in apps in like defining the radius, the width of the radius and min samples in defining what is um, a core point, so when to stop. 
if there is a point that is um, not reached by any um, by any cluster, so this guy n here. Um, is never reached by by red. Uh, this is a noise point, and so this will because it's not a core sample, it would not start its own cluster. And so points that are never reached by any of the clusters and um, don't have uh, min samples minus one many neighbors are considered noise. So actually, um, DB scan, in addition to labeling points as clusters, also has like outlier points which are labeled as noise. And so um, in this example here, all the points that are labeled red are core samples of the red cluster. The points that are, well, maybe I shouldn't say red cluster. I should say this cluster. The red points are all the core um, points of this cluster. The yellow points are also part of um, the same cluster, but they are not core. And so they, they don't, won't propagate the cluster label outside anymore. So I have a nice animation that I stole from some, uh, David uh, Sheehan's uh, GitHub page uh, for two different parameter settings. Um, and so here, dbscan does not have the number of samples as a parameter. It has um, only epsilon and uh, min points. And so actually, can I restart this? Okay, I don't know. Oh, there, there it goes. It restarts. So you can see that it starts with a random point here in both cases, and um, it spreads out the blue until none of the points um, are core samples anymore. And uh, then it picks another random point, which is the green point, which spreads out. Um, the then here it keeps randomly picking points if they are out here and don't have. Uh, eight neighbors in their epsilon neighborhood, then basically they're uh, marked as noise, which is blue. Uh, here on the right hand side, um, min point is six, and the epsilon neighborhood is a little bit smaller. Um, so, this actually the smaller epsilon neighborhood would uh, means that there's less clusters, so clusters are less commonly merged together. Um, and min points means that it allows smaller clusters instead of labeling them noise. And so these two uh, basically together mean that we will get a couple of small clusters here and here and here and here and so on. Um, so the question, sorry, I maybe I didn't, I didn't run to this. Uh, um, very well. If you pick a point at random and it doesn't have uh, enough neighbors, then it will be labeled noise. It will not be considered a core point. So if the point you pick in this case on the left doesn't have um, seven neighbors within the epsilon radius, it will be labeled noise and it will randomly pick another point. If none of the points have enough neighbors, all of the points will be noise. And so no, you don't increase the epsilon value. The epsilon value is fixed and user specified in this algorithm. So I want to illustrate a little bit the, um, the influence of these two parameters. So they are a little bit more tricky to pick than the number of samples I find usually. Um, I mean, it's nice that they can automatically determine the number of samples, but like picking epsilon and min samples, I find to be a little bit tricky. And so here you can see, um, basically, if you increase x, um, the number, the, the points that are considered neighbors are bigger and bigger. And basically, you grow clusters and you keep merging clusters. So the colored points here are clusters, and the small white points are noise points. So what's the difference? I got a question between not core and noise. So not core, actually, wait, wait. Here, here are examples of points that are not core. These are the small triangles. The points that are not core are still considered part of the cluster. Or here, 
So basically, if you if you look at um, this point, this point has two neighbors, these two guys. So it's a core point. And then these two neighbors were are assigned to the cluster red. But this point here doesn't have two neighbors. So if there was another point here, it wouldn't propagate the label to the other point here. Noise labels have no label and cycle learns encoded as minus one, whereas not core points have the cluster label. All right, um, so pros and cons of DB scan. So one of the pros is that it can learn arbitrary cluster shapes. Um, that's, as we know, not true for k-means. It's um, also not true for, um, a kilometer of clustering unless you specify a particular topology. And um, another uh, pro is maybe it can detect outliers. Uh, con is that it needs two non-obvious parameters to adjust. And so, um, yeah, it's a little bit tricky. Or maybe I should say here again, um, if you change the number of min samples, the only thing you will do is either remove clusters or or make points um, not core anymore. So that you won't really essentially uh, change the structure. So if you go down the rows, you don't, uh, sorry, down the columns, you don't change the structure, but you just drop some of the clusters. Um, so here basically you have three clusters, here you still have three clusters, here you only have one cluster that was the cluster with the most samples. Because if you set min samples to five, each cluster will have will need to have at least min samples, many samples. Um, yeah. So the min samples um, parameter is a little bit easier to tune than the X parameter in this case, in, in the sense that it basically just determines at what size do you consider a group of noise points noise and when do you consider them a cluster. And as I said, there's an uh, improved version called HDB scan. So the last um, algorithm I want to talk about today is uh, Gaussian mixture models. And um, it's, I want to talk briefly about the general idea of mixture models and then about the particular Gaussian mixture models approach. The reason why I want to talk about this today is that it is actually quite related to k-means and um, there's many similarities. So the concept of mixture models is much more general than the concept of clusters in a sense. Um, so a mixture model is a model um, that is, so it's a model for uh, probability density function, which you can also uh, say it's a generative model. So we want to find a model for P of X. Mixture models are models that are basically, as the name suggests, a mixture of simple or relatively simple probability density functions. So here you say the, the density function over all of X is um, a sum over probability density function P, PK, um, of X. So you have K different mixture components and each of these PK is of some simple form with some parameter theta and they're weighted by some um, weighting factor pi K and the pi K ha um, have to sum up to one for this to be a probability distribution. And so um, this uh, allows you to build more complex probability distributions from simple probability distributions and saying like, I allow multiple of these probability distributions uh, and I put them together. And um, in uh, a Gaussian mixture model, each PK is a Gaussian model. And so it has, uh, so P of X, then would be the mixture of K Gaussian models. So each of the Gaussian models 
has like a mean and a covariance matrix, and then um, each has a, y, uh, a, a weight PK, which says um, in the overall distribution, how likely is it to um, for a point to be of one of these particular distributions. And so one way I think it, it is, um, one way to think about generative model or mixture models um, that I find helpful is to think of what is known as a generative process. So let's say I want to sample a point from this distribution. What would this look like? And so if I have this mixture model, then um, like, let's say I, I'm given these means and these uh, covariance matrices or precision matrices and um, these weights, the way to sample a point from this mixture distribution is first I sample uh, from a multinomial distribution over, uh, of pi, um, which distribution I want to uh, pull a sample from. So multinomial distribution of pi, this is basically um, a k-sided biased uh, die or coin, um, where each uh, side has the weight corresponding to p, uh, pi k. So um, let's say if all of them, uh, if k was five and all of them were equal, it would mean with probability one fifth, I would pick a, a particular um, component. Um, usually, obviously, they are not, not equal, so you have one probability associated with each component. So first you pick from this distribution which of the components you want to create a point from, and then you create a point uh, from this distribution using the parameters of this distribution. So then I pick a point from the normal distribution uh, with parameters mu k and sigma k. So this is how you would generate a point given that someone gave you this distribution. In practice, usually someone is giving you the points and you're trying to estimate the distribution. However, as I said, I think thinking about how to, how to draw or how to sample a point from the distribution is um, a good way to think about this. But yeah, so in practice, what we want to do is given a sample from this distribution, our data points, we want to figure out, and given um, some number k, we want to figure out what are the mu k, the sigma k, and the pi k. So what should be um, the k different Gaussian uh, distributions that are mixed, and what should be their mixture weights? This is a non-convex optimization uh, problem again. So we kind of have to um, rely to heuristics. Usually it's um, initialized with k-means with some random restarts and then is optimized uh, using a procedure that's quite similar to um, the k-means algorithm. It is known as the EM algorithm, um, which also iterates between two steps. And um, one of the steps, wait. <clears throat> the, okay, I start here with the maximization step. This is the expectation step. EM stands for expectation maximization. So um, in the one step, you assign points to their components, though in k means, we assign points to the cluster centers. In the EM algorithm, we do what's called a soft assignment, um, meaning we look at a posterior, posterior probability of a point to become to be from each of the each of the components. So um, for each point we compute how likely is it to be com free from component one, from component two, from component three, and so on. After we have this soft assignment of points to components, we compute the mean of each component and the variant of each component by comp by um, using the soft assignment as weights to the points and then compute the weight of mean and the weight of variance. And then you iterate these two um, 
two procedures. So this is, yeah, it's, as I said, it's very similar to k-means, only that you, instead of doing a hard assignment, you do a soft assignment. And instead of just computing the mean, you compute the mean and the variance. To maybe give you um, a little bit of uh, an idea of what this might look like in practice in, in 1D, so let's say um, we have only one-dimensional data, so which is uh, drawn on the x-axis here, and say we have the probability density on the y-axis. And so if we have um, three distributions like this and this and this, so these are three Gaussian distributions, if we mix them, I think here they may even be mixed equal. No, they're not mixed equally. Um, you can see this one's probably has the highest weight, and then this one, and then this one. So um, the distribution of the mixture model is then the weighted sum of these distributions. And so here you now have um, a model for distribution that looks very complicated, but it uh, we can compute this distribution. We can compute everything about it exactly. We can sample from it. We can compute the density and it has a relatively simple parametric form, but it's much more complex than using a single Gaussian distribution. So why do we care about these uh, mixture models? So you can think of the mixture models as just um, another way to do clustering. So you could, once you computed the mixture model, um, you could do a hard assignment. You could say, well, um, which is the most likely component that, uh, for a point to come, up, come from um, and do an assignment to this component, then you basically have a fancier version of k-means. You can get a parametric density model if you are interested in having a density model for your data. So if you want a model for p of x that you can easily fit this might be uh, a, a good method. You can actually also use it for feature extraction using a method known Fisher vectors, though I haven't seen this used in, in a little while. So if you want to um, use this using scikit-learn, there's um, a Gaussian mixture or uh, class in a in the mixture model, actually, yeah, so this should be the, the correct one, yeah. Um, you have to set the number of components. In this uh, example, I said three components, you call fit uh, on uh, your data X, and you get the means and the covariance matrices. And here you get three means. This is the 2D data set I'm using. Um, you get three means and three covariance matrices. And so if you look at, um, sorry, if you call predict, uh, predict will give you a hard assignment of the labels. It will tell you points here belong to component green, the points here belong to component orange, the points here belong to component uh, blue. Um, you can also do uh, probability estimates because you have a, the probability density function. Um, there's two different ways to compute probability estimates. One is predict proba. Predict proba will give you the um, probability for each point to um, come from a certain component. So this is like the predict proba, proba from a classifier, only the classes are not specified a priori. So here it tells you basically um, the first point certainly came from, from, from uh, the first component. This point certainly came from the last component. There are some points here, it's only mostly certain it came from the second component. So this is a probability distribution over the three components, so they all sum to one. Um, you can also ask, well, how likely is a point to be generated from, um, sorry, how, how likely is this point under the distribution of all components that I learned, you can get this with score samples. And score samples um, 
Uh, what was it? Um, square samples tells you how likely is a mo is a point under the data distribution that we learned. So this is just um, one dimensional vector. So this is just one number for each point. And this is the thing that I drew with the density lines here. It says, well, po points are dense here, here, and here. And the further you go out, the less dense they are. And so you could use this, for example, for outlier detection. Um, another important parameter for uh, Gaussian mixture models is um, different restrictions for the covariance matrix. So this is quite similar to um, the difference between uh, linear discriminant analysis and, discrim and quadratic discriminant analysis that we talked about last time, only that was the supervised setting and now we're in the unsupervised setting where we don't have any true labels. But uh, we're again, we're trying to um, estimate covariance matrices here and um, the more we restrict them, the easier it gets. And so the, the simplest, or one of the simplest thing is um, you can make them what's called spherical. Spherical means the covariance matrix for each of the component is um, a diagonal matrix and uh, for each component has um, the same number everywhere in diagonal. That means the, each Gaussian is spherical, so it has uh, the same variance in all directions. Um, so this only means there's n components, maybe uh, many numbers to estimate. So, they, so to estimate, so there's only n components, many degrees of freedom. It's one number per component. It's how the radius or the variance of each component. You can make this a little bit more complicated and say, well, I allow the each component to be have a diagonal, diagonal uh, covariance matrix. Um, this is still pretty restricted. So this means um, I allow arbitrary component, uh, arbitrary entries on the diagonal for each component, uh, which means you can have ellipses, but the ellipses need to be axis aligned. So um, this is an example of this. Um, you can uh, also, there's a variant uh, which ties the covariance matrices. This is basically the unsupervised version of the linear discriminant analysis where you have a single covariance matrix. It's a full covariance matrix, so it's number of features squared, but it's shared among all of the points. Sorry, it's shared among all of the, the distributions. And then you can have full, full meaning, um, you have a full covariance matrix for each of the clusters or each of the components. Um, this is clearly the most flexible, but also uh, it has the most degree of freedom. So it's the most likely to overfit in some way. So then um, the degrees of freedom are basically number of components times number of features squared. So one full matrix, uh, it's one full, con I mean, so this is O of, um, number of features squared, the uh, covariance matrix is symmetric, so it's actually half that. But um, so you have uh, a full symmetric covariance matrix that's separate for each of the components. All right. Oh, I'm already over. So um, let me finish up. So some of the uh, downsides of um, k-means are not present anymore in the Gaussian mixture models as long as um, you set the, either you have enough data or you um, set the covariance um, uh, type correctly. Or maybe one thing I should say is like, basically in very high dimensions, you probably want diagonal, uh, spherical or diagonal. In lower dimensions, you can get away with uh, the full, but in high dimensions, estimating as full covariance matrix might be kind of tricky. Okay, so the example for k-means that I showed earlier with these um, three elongated blobs, that doesn't work for k-means, but because Gaussian mixture models have uh, some um, model of covariance, it uh, can find sort of the, the natural clusters. And similarly for this example, 
where there's different radii between the clusters, uh, the Gaussian mixture model can correctly identify um, or recover this. This is kind of sort of trivial examples because I generated the data basically from a mixture of Gaussian models. So having K Gaussian blocks means I generated data from a Gaussian mixture model. Obviously, if I generate the data from a Gaussian mixture model, the Gaussian mixture model will be a good fit for the data. That's sort of a tautology. Um, all right, so to wrap up, um, the algorithms, so k-means is really simple and classic, can only do convex cluster shapes that are determined by the cluster centers. Um, you can easily predict on new points and the cluster centers fully give you like a parametric model of the clustering. Um, agglomerative uh, can take the input topology into account and if you have some particular topology, they can be very fast. They're also nice because they produce a hierarchy of clusterings and you can look at the dendrogram to look at the hierarchical structure of clusters. Um, DB scan is nice because it can, um, there, there's a question and the answer is no. Um, that the slide is correct. And um, so in DB scan, um, uh, can have arbitrary uh, cluster shapes, can detect outliers, and um, but often you have very differently sized clusters, which is maybe not what you naturally want. Um, Gaussian mixed models can model for variance, they can give you a soft clustering, and uh, but they can be kind of hard to fit in higher dimensions if you want to fit the whole covariance matrix. Um, There's a nice example on the scikit-learn website. Well, I say it's nice because I made half of it, but uh, maybe I'm biased. Um, on different 2D data sets showing how different clustering algorithms perform. And so um, we haven't talked about all of these, um, but um, it's a ni nice guide. And you can see here how, for this example, the Gaussian mixture model and the uh, DB scan and uh, I guess that mini batch k means is very similar to k means how they perform. I mean, I think these examples are actually, I'm not sure if they were first in my lecture and then they were on the website or the other way around. Anyway, um, I think they were first in my lecture. Um, one thing you should keep in mind is that this is 2D data and 2D data, the intuition derived from 2D data doesn't necessarily translate to um, the full uh, to high dimensional data sets. Like you're not gonna have like a banana or two moons like this in a hundred dimension. That's just not how data looks like. So whether it can, uh, an algorithm can model these um, two moons data set correctly, I'm not sure if it's a very interesting feature of a clustering algorithm. All right. Um, and maybe, uh, to end again, um, one of the things uh, to think about always is why do you do the things that you're doing uh, for clustering? I said they're most commonly used for exploratory analysis and um, sometimes for feature engineering. And the question you should ask yourself is like, if you're running clustering, why are you running clustering? What is your goal? And um, if your goal is exploratory analysis, how are you going to inspect? Um, say the clusters, what are, you, what are you gonna learn from them and how can you use this in solving your actual problem? Um, okay, so thank you uh, for staying with me, at least uh, most of you. And um, I'm happy to take any other questions. I'm gonna answer the last question I got in a little bit more detail, but, uh, so, but that's it for today. So there was um, the last question that I got was, in this slide, for spherical, it says n components. And the question was, shouldn't it be n features? Um, and so, no, so if we have one number for, per component. So blue has basically the number that gives you the radius. And green has a number that gives you a radius. And orange has a number that gives you a radius. But the radius is the same in every dimension. So here, there's only two dimensions. But if you have 10 dimensions, it would be the same radius in each dimension. So 
uh, the number of degrees of freedom is independent from the number of dimensions. It's just one number per component. Um, so I got a question asking, is there something that's particularly good for genetic data? And um, I think k-means is relatively standard. So one thing that people really like to do on genetic data, well, okay, is so maybe also look at HDB scan. Um, people like to do NMF on uh, genetic data. And uh, unfortunately this year, because of the all the craziness, we are not going to talk about NMF. That's a non-negative matrix factorization. It's not really clustering. It's somewhere between clustering and PCA. It's in my book, and there's also a lecture about it last year. It's a little bit of limited use, but it's very helpful for um, genetic data. So if you're working on uh, gene expression data or something like this, then uh, you should know about uh, uh, non-negative matrix factorization even though we don't cover it in this course. Um, but other than that, I guess um, maybe k-means and HDB scan would be my, my reply.